I have to tell you that uh, one of the greatest compliments I ever had came from unsuspectingly from a family where I had given a couple of my books to read. Uh, I think it was uh, Why You Were Born was one of them, and, uh, and the other one was had to do with uh, uh, <clears throat> having a life management system. And what was a surprise to me is the lady said to me, she said, don't you ever have your own thoughts? <laughs> she said, everything you write is from the Bible. Don't you ever think for yourself? <laughs> and I said, no, I don't. <laughs> I can't think of a higher compliment than to be a, 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 a teller of the truth, right? Teller of the truth. Well, today our subject is kind of important and it is uh, how God has designed real prayer. So get your notes together and get ready because here we go. Let's take a look at some of these scriptures and understand what real prayer is really all about. Number one, we understand that real prayer was made possible by the cross of Christ. Whoa. Before the cross, men were adverse to God entirely, but watch this now. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Watch it now. For he is our peace. He has made us one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition <coughs> between us. Whoa. This is why when we pray, we always pray in the name of Jesus because he's the only one that can give access to God the Father. Only way. So real prayer is made possible by the cross of Christ. In fact, uh, that's why, that's why um, uh, I, I would almost chose this as my title slide, because it's only through the cross that we have access to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Prayer is possible. Access to God is possible only because of what Christ did on the cross. That's right. Now, we must move uh, and, and look at the scripture one more time, because he is our peace who has broke, who's made us one with God and broken down the partition that separated us. This is so delightful. Now, we want to learn a bunch of things about prayer, so let's just keep going. And that is this, <clears throat> that the prayer designed by God is a full-time presence and a 24-hour-a-day, seven days a week response from God. It's not a little dabble, do you? It's not just a little prayer here and a little shot there. It is a constant presence. Prayer is a constant condition. That's why the Scripture says praying always with all prayer. Now let me look at, let's look at some more of the scripture here. And supplication in the spirit, watching thereunto, make sure you do this full time, with all perseverance and supplication, stay, prayer is designed to be full time presence of God. And let's take a look at this. Um, it's designed for constant communion with God. Constant. Now, I'd like to just stop for a moment. Do you remember? And let me give you a definition of prayer. Prayer is having God in all your thoughts. You remember the scripture? The wicked. How does that scripture start? Through the pride of his countenance. He does not seek after God, for God is not in all his thoughts. 
If you want to know the cause of wickedness, it is the absence of God in our thoughts. And it is the pride that causes that absence of God, because we think we know it all. And so, through the pride of his countenance, he doesn't seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. But prayer is designed to be full-time God in all our thoughts. So let's take a look at this scripture now. Because the, this is the basis of communion with God. Communion with God. It's not something you stop and start. It's something that stays there all the time. Verse we've already mentioned, praying always with all prayer. Watch it now. <clears throat> That's why the scripture says pray without ceasing. Keep God in all your thoughts because prayer designed by God is not a little here and a little there or wait till I've got a problem. It's living in his presence. It's living in communion with God all the time. So let's go forward now. Oh, I forgot to put this verse in here. Let your conversation, that is your, your lifestyle, be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. Look at this, because he has said, look at this now, I will never leave you or forsake you. If God doesn't seem present in your life, guess who moved? It wasn't God. He says, I'm going to be there for you all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time. You said, I will never leave you. Prayer is designed for constant communion with God who says he'll be there all the time. And I will never, I will never, never. That's a big word. I will never forsake you. Whoa. Why is that? So you can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. And I will not fear what man may do to me. And so you need to get the next point of design prayer by God. It's a source of divine help. Prayer is where you go to get help from God, who knows everything, Whoa, whose wisdom has no limit, whose grace has no measure, whose power hath no measure, known unto men. Wow. So watch this now. It's a source of divine help so that we can boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. When you got God for you, remember the scripture? Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. No fear, no fear, no fear, no fear. Now, real prayer must be without hypocrisy. So when Jesus teaches on prayer, this is what he says. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites are. So what were they like? And by the way, here's a good definition for hypocrite or hypocrisy. It is assuming a false appearance a false appearance of virtue or goodness. I don't know about you, but you know, I watch the news and there's some tragedy reported in the news, Cash says, oh, our prayers go with them. Our prayers go out to them. What are they talking about? It's not prayers you don't send to somebody. Prayer is conversing directly with God and God alone through Christ, right? So watch you now. Don't be like the hypocrites. Because watch it now. They like to pray. And watch this now. They like to be seen of men. 
The danger in our culture right now, even within the Christian culture, is we go telling people, oh, I'm praying for you. As if that's got some political power, as if that's got some social influence. It is a misuse of prayer. Because yeah. they want people to think they're praying for them, whether they do or don't. Don't be like the hypocrites. They like to pray. They like to pray. So they can be seen of men. So Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, they got their reward. They got their political points. They got people thinking they're really nice people because they prayed for me. But don't be like the hypocrites. Real prayer must be without an audience. <clears throat> now when you pray, enter to the closet, and when you shut the door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. Now be careful, let me make sure you get this right. Real prayer is, not, is without an audience. But it can be real prayer when you are praying with participants, because they're not an audience, they're participants. And so if two or three people get together to pray, that's not an audience, that's a participation. You got that? Don't mix up audience versus participation. So real prayer must be without an audience. Now why would, why would Jesus say this? <laughs> I'm thinking, um, the reason is because when you have an audience, you say what you say to influence the audience instead of God, who is the subject. Well, there you right. go. Okay. Uh -huh. There you go. Now, if, for example, when I witness to people on the street or wherever it is, I don't do it with an audience. I like one on one because if that person has, if there are two or three there and the other are audience, uh, then this guy's response is going to be based on what his audience is going to yeah, see. So reality is left there. That's why God wants to speak from your spirit to one spirit at a time. Oh. So <clears throat> real prayer must be without an audience. Now, now, now don't miss this. That real prayer is praying secretly. Shut the door. Now, when I was a kid, I, my dad quoted this verse, and I'd go home look into my closet. There was no room. There were baseball bats and footballs and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> so I didn't understand it back in that day. But a closet, a place closed off from everybody and everything else. A place of secret. Watch now. And the father because this is where reality kicks in now. He's the only one that sees in secret. And so between you and God himself, in the secret place, you get through, because real prayer is done just between you and God. And what does he promise to do? He says he will reward you Openly. Well, my goodness, isn't that delightful? Wow. Well, so many scriptures come into my mind. I'm, I'm going to try and resist them, but no audience. That's why God says, be still and know I'm God. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Now, real praying first, first requires the forgiveness of all our offenders. Whoa. When you stand praying, 
forgive. Oh. If you have ought against anybody, before you start to pray, you forgive. And why is that? <clears throat> when you stand praying, forgive. If you have ought against any, and why is it that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses? There are some things you can only get if you give them away first. For example, Blessed are the merciful, they shall obtain mercy. Ooh. If you give mercy, you get mercy. You give and it shall be given unto you, you see. see? So before prayer can be effective and real, we first must forgive those that trespass against us. Watch it now, I don't want you to miss this. Because by forgiving others, we get forgiveness by God. And now when you pray, you're praying from the ground of a forgiven saint. Yeah. Whoa. But if you do not, Forgive. Neither will your heavenly Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. <coughs> now, this sounds radical. Guess what? It is radical. You know, it reminds me of that scripture. If you come to offer to the altar a gift to God, and there remember that your brother hath ought against you, leave your gift. Go get reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. It's because God is so vitally committed to the wellness and the well-being <laughs> of relationships. He doesn't, want to he doesn't want you to live unforgiven, and he doesn't want the people who have offended you to be unforgiven. So understand that real praying first requires the forgiveness of others. Oh. Oh. Now, real prayer is without vain repetitions. <clears throat> when you pray, use, look at this, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. Islam, uh, Hinduism, they have, they have what's called a mantra. And you go to God with your mantra. You go to God by repeating the same thing over and over again that produces no results. So when you pray, don't use vain repetition. Now, let me be clear. It doesn't mean you can never repeat a prayer. It's a vain repetition that you can't do. Not, not, not a repetition. Remember the passage was read this morning. The lady kept asking, and the judge gave in and, and rewarded her because he didn't want to listen to her any longer. 
So watch this now. Vain repetition. Don't do it. <clears throat> now, we are to pray with humility, but not shyness. You don't have to come to God shy. You'd certainly need to come with humility. In fact, the people who, who don't have humility probably don't come to God. So they do it themselves, right? So watch this now. Don't come to God shy. So here's what the scripture says. Let us come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You don't need to be bashful. You can be bold. Let's come boldly, boldly, boldly. Now, if you understand, bold does not mean brashly. Let's look at another scripture. So that you can boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear what men shall do unto me. Bold, be, there's things to be bold. What is boldness? It is confidence that what I have to say or do is approved by God. So we pray with humility, but not with shyness, but rather with boldness. <clears throat> uh, here it is, boldness. It's confidence, but not brashness. <clears throat> We're to pray with humility, not shyness. <clears throat> and then real prayer is entered into with thanksgiving. Attitude is really important. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise and be thankful unto him and bless his name. Wow. Gratefulness. Some people have tried to turn prayer into a complaint session. Never expressing grateful for what God has already done but in an irritating human way, they go to God with grumbling instead of thanksgiving. Grumbling. You know what scripture says about that? Do you know how many people died in the wilderness because they grumbled? Oh. Don't go to God grumbling. Go with thanksgiving. Well, watch it now. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with thanksgiving. And bless his name, for the Lord is good. That's why you can be thankful. And his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. So, enter it with thanksgiving. <clears throat> then, real prayer is often without an agenda. Whoa. Not every prayer has to have an agenda. <clears throat> so, uh, let, me, let me use this word first. Um, prayer is often communion. No agenda. Just being in his presence. <laughs> oh. Look at this. Thou wilt show me the path of life. Look at this. In thy presence is fullness of joy. And at thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Sometimes prayer is just 
being there with God. No agenda. Huh. The upright shall dwell in thy presence. Just sit there, stand there. Just don't bother with an agenda at the moment. Just enjoy presence. Most people think that praying has to do a whole lot of talking. <laughs> you don't have to say a word. Just dwell in his presence. That's why this famous scripture, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down. Just lay down, David. Stop. Stop. Why does he do that? Why does he want you still, sitting beside still waters? The answer is because just being there, connected, connected. Your soul gets restored, no agenda necessary. Just sitting in the presence of God. Real prayer doesn't always have to have an agenda. It's just dwelling. Because if you dwell in the secret place, no audience, nobody else, just you and God, Dwell in the secret place of the Most High, you will abide. Oh, abide. That's a great Bible word. Abiding in the vine. Remember, you'll abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Because you dwell. It just sit in his presence and your soul, your mind, and your emotions, they don't just get rested, they get restored. Brought back to wellness. Mm. Oh. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest, shall you be saved. Watch it now. Watch this scripture. Because real prayer is often without an agenda. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. It reminds me of this chorus we used to sing, shut in with God in a secret place. There in this presence beholding his face, gaining new power to run in life's race, I long to be shut in with.
So what happens there? In returning to him and resting in him, you'll be saved from whatever, whatever's trying to get at you. Now watch this now. In quietness, And in confidence shall be your strength. Too many voices yelling at you. Too many commercials in your face. Too many people with agendas trying to control your mind and your pocketbook. Everybody out to cut and grab and grasp from you. There's a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God. A place where sin cannot molest near to the heart of God. So a real prayer is simply being with God. Conscious of him and nobody or anything else, including an agenda. Rest in the Lord, <clears throat> wait patiently for. So this is really one of the benefits of real prayer. <clears throat> now, real prayer is a dialogue, not a monologue. <clears throat> it is more important that I hear from heaven than that heaven hear from me. <clears throat> Most people think prayer is advising the almighty, omniscient God what he ought to do for the next 24 hours as if he doesn't know. <clears throat> and it's because prayer, as you're going to see in a moment, has been so perverted, that's why our subject is real prayer, been so perverted that they think that prayer is getting my will done on earth through heaven instead of getting his will done on earth through me. Then that's why people quit praying. Because they can't get God to do what they want him to do. <clears throat> Instead, watch the scripture now. If you call unto me, look at this. I'll answer. <clears throat> I'll not only answer you, but I'm going to show you. Whoa. See, prayer isn't just sending something up, it's getting something down. That's why only God can do this. And by the way, well, let me try not to divert. <laughs> not easy for the preacher to do that. He says he will answer. And watch this. He will not only answer, but he will show you in one place says he's going to show you things to come. Look at what he's going to show you. He's going to show you great things. He's going to show you mighty things. He's going to show you stuff that you don't know. Oh my goodness. How delightful is that? That real prayer is bringing a question to God and letting him answer it. And you'll go away from that moment of prayer, or maybe you won't, you just stay there all the time in his presence. But now you're equipped, you're empowered. <clears throat> so prayer is a 
dialogue. God still speaks today. Now, if you go to Isaiah, you'll find out kind of how he speaks. He doesn't yell and scream. He doesn't throw a fit. He's never out of control. He's never got a pointed finger condemning and putting you down. Never, never. Never destructive, always constructive, always lifting you up, not putting you down. Always taking you forward, not backwards. That's what he's like, you see. So how will you know him? And Isaiah says, watch it now. His voice is not in the thunder. It's not in the explosion. It's not in the fire. But thine ears shall hear a word behind thee. Saying, hey David, this is the way. Walk in. My son, my daughter, relax, let me show you the way. It was tragic that they spent 40 years in the wilderness. 40 years to travel, if they had done directly and followed the directions of God, 11 days, 11 days would have covered the territory, but it took them 40 years. Because they wouldn't listen. They wouldn't do their own thing. Uh, beloved, I have to pause here because I'm telling you something now that's so sacred. And so few people know. And even less experience this. But one of the most important things in your life is the ability to hear God speak to you. So thine ears shall hear a word behind thee. This comes from behind. And it says, <clears throat> for hey, son or daughter, this is the way. Walk in it. And when you're going somewhere, when you turn to the right or to the hand or to the left, I might get in trouble for this, I don't know. But... Um, I don't know if I'm supposed to share my wife's stories without permission first. <laughs> but you've heard the story before, so I think I'm in good grounds. She's driving with a coworker talking about the things of God, which is what you do when you're with my wife, you talk about God more than anything else. Love that woman. They're coming over a bridge approaching a bridge. They're following a truck loaded with sod. She's talking to the co-worker about listening to God's voice. And she said, well, this may seem really funny to me, but God's telling me to change lanes. <laughs> so she changed lanes in front of the co-worker. <clears throat> and just after changing lanes, a pile of sod fell off the truck in the lane in which she had been. Did you know that God cares about you? Yeah. 
You are precious in his sight. Over a thousand times in the Bible, <clears throat> you'll find the phrase, and the Lord said, and the Lord spake, and he hasn't changed. Real prayer is listening. And that's why the scripture says this, as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. Oh, my. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Amen. Almost done. <clears throat> by the way, this is only part one. <laughs> the best is yet to come next time we get together. <laughs> Now, real prayer <clears throat> is often the impartation of wisdom from God. Wisdom, wisdom, smarts. <clears throat> smarts. We've got a book coming out, soon to be released, Hope, called the How to Get Smart Book. It's based on the, what the Bible says about wisdom. <laughs> uh, it's a lot of chapters. Because <clears throat> God... Wisdom is the principal thing. Did you know that? And with all of your getting, get wisdom and get understanding with it. Yeah. Understand why it's so smart. Wisdom is simply the Bible word for the contemporary word smart. Intelligent. So, so prayer is connected to this. I want you to see this. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Ooh, that's, that's called praying, right? And watch it, because God is not stingy ever. He's willing to give to all men liberally and abradeth not let me give you a Phillips translation of this. Um, it says that God gives wisdom without making you feel guilty or ashamed. If you lack wisdom, ask of God. He will give it to you without making you feel. That's what this word abradeth means. He doesn't abrade you. He doesn't say, oh, well, you dummy, here's the answer. He doesn't put you down. Now let's go back and take a look at this one more time. He gives, the request is for wisdom, right? The ability to know what to do in a given situation. In fact, we have a good definition, wisdom, is seeing life from God's point of view. Seeing and understanding life from God's point of view. Now, a good uh, example had I thought ahead of time to do this, and I would have put up on the screen a picture <clears throat> of a maze. You've got to find your way through the maze. Well, if the maze is life-size and you can only see left, right, and center, but if you can get above the maze and look down on the maze, you can find your way through. That's what wisdom is. Wisdom is the ability to see and respond to every life situation, not from stuck down here in the middle of it, but from God's point of view, which is above it. Oh, this wisdom thing is big stuff, big stuff. Well, let's get back, <clears throat> or we'll be here all afternoon. <laughs> it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, Philip translated, but let him ask in sincere faith, without secret doubts as to whether he really wants to know God's will or not. Let him ask faith, nothing wavering. 
Because he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea driven by the wind and tossed. Let that man not think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Why is that? Because a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. God wants you to see straight on every area of life and not have a double mind. Now, this double-minded thing is, uh, in our culture is called bipolar. There's an awful lot of spiritual bipolar, by the way. People think one way and God, oh, oh, back and forth. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So let the brother, now I love this. Let the brother who of low degree, the guy who doesn't think he's very much, and the guy that other people don't think he's very much, <laughs> rejoice. In that he is exalted. How did he get exalted? Because God gave him the smarts. Gave him the wisdom. All right. <clears throat> One more point. And I have to warn you that next time we get together, it is uh, the most important conclusion for this. But it would not be right to end this without understanding that real prayer is God applying his word. <clears throat> you will never get God to do evil. That's right. We're supposed to make our request known to God. But if you ask God to do something that's dumb, he's not going to do it. If it's evil, he's not going to do it. And this is why a lot of people don't pray, because they ask for dumb things. And God doesn't do it, and so they get mad at God. God. God will never tell you in prayer something devoid of, separate from, or different from what is already spoken in his word. Amen. The only way to be more spiritual is to be more scriptural. Prayer is not some separate notion of God divorced from what he's already said in his word. Mm -hmm. That's why the scripture comes so clearly and says, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Now let me show you something about it. And it's profitable. Profitable. Now watch here now. Because in prayer, often God parallels exactly what he's already spoken in his word. In fact, he will never contradict it. Never. Never. It's forever settled in heaven. The word of God is forever settled in heaven. And the word is, the scripture says it endureth to all generations. It's as accurate today as it ever was. But, oh, but, but, watch out for the translators. Because the scripture says that no scripture is a private, no prophecy is a private interpretation. Nobody gets to say, my version is this. Oh. You can, you will, there are translations of the Bible out right now and very popular ones. The publisher publishes it, publishes it and also publishes the Satanic Bible and also publishes the joy of gay sex. Is something wrong, publisher? Excuse me. Because the scriptures are so sacred so precise. Now, we follow the King James, and I'll tell you why. Over 55 scholars had to come into agreement when they moved from one language to English, from other languages to English. Whoa. No private interpretation was allowed. We have perverted people interpreting scripture. 
Now, if you were the devil, wouldn't you like that? If you could pervert the Bible. Now, the only problem with the King James is it was, it's, and, and, and maybe I should be careful here about the New King James, but the change in linguistics over the years um, needs to be taken into consideration. For example, the scripture talks about the bowels of mercy. <laughs> well, bowels today have a different notion than the bowels back in those days. The bowels back in those days meant your heart, not your abdomen. So there are words that have changed and we need to compensate for that. But let's get back to this now. That all scripture, all scripture, all scripture is given by the inspiration. And in fact, you know what the Bible says? <clears throat> it's, it's, it's been proven, it's been tried in the fire like silver seven times. Uh, yeah. And every word of God is true and every word of God is pure. Now watch it. Comes from the inspiration of God. <clears throat> it's profitable. Now let me show you, when you pray, how profitable prayer is because prayer always coincides with God's word. It's going to straighten out your doctrine. Whoa. Whoa. Don't believe the theologian, believe your Bible. There are whole theological books, volumes, peddled in colleges and seminaries with men's idea about the Bible instead of the Bible's idea about the Bible. <clears throat> I'm resisting temptation to tell you stories about this, but yeah, I'm resisting, I'm resisting. <laughs> when I was in college, I was... <laughs> Come on, preacher. Come on. Come on, preacher. Okay, I'll give you one. <laughs> Amen. I quit resisting here. <clears throat> so can God change his mind? What does the Bible say? Or what does the theologians say? The eternal now heresy has got people thinking God can never change his mind. So I'm sitting in class, right? We're just studying the book of Genesis and Moses is up in the mountain with God getting the Ten Commandments, and they look down, and they see the people have coin, pooled their gold and are worshiping the golden calf. <clears throat> and God says, Moses, I'm going to destroy them. Look at what they're doing. I'm going to destroy those people. And the next verse, and Moses says, God, you need to repent of the evil, not the sin, but the evil you're about to do. Next verse. And God repented. I lifted up my hand in class and said, Sir, God changed his mind. No, God didn't change his mind. God said what he said, knowing full well that he would change his mind. <coughs> oh, so, sir, you mean God lied? You mean that God said he was going to change his mind, but he knew in advance he wasn't really going to? So you're making God out to be a liar? Excuse me, sir, I believe the Bible, not your theology. I almost got kicked out of class for that. And I probably should have because I had a bad attitude. <laughs> believe the Bible. Amen. Now watch it. Let your doctrine come from the Bible, not from a theologian who thinks he knows better. It's not just profitable for doctrine, but it's profitable for reproof. So when you're in prayer, <clears throat> when God speaks, sometimes it's a reproof. You're going the wrong way. Stop it. Go this way instead. That's a reproof. Or it's a correction. Or it's an instruction in righteousness. So why would God do all this? Why is prayer so linked up with his word? The answer is so that you can be perfect. Three. 
truly furnished unto all good works. You're, f you're fully functional. Perfect. Well, the theologian says nobody's perfect. God's goal for you is perfection. It only takes one error to take you a long way off track. Amen. And so, beloved prayer, contact with God is the way forward.